So chapter number six here is kind of a continuation of, or it's, it's a little bit more of a pivot from chapter number five. Chapter number five, we were talking about the function of a protein. Now in chapter number six, what we're going to do is we're going to hone in on and focus on one of those functions. And we're going to be focusing on the function of enzymes. So enzymes are catalysts. They increase reaction rates and they are not used up. Most enzymes are, very, are globular proteins. However, there are some that, uh, for instance, ribozymes and ribosomal RNA, which are not proteins, but rather they are RNA, and they catalyze reactions. And that's a little bit weird because I know whenever I think of nucleic acids, I generally think of my first thought is DNA, and the second thought would be RNA. And I'm thinking about those as really just kind of inert molecules or molecules that all that they do is really provide information um, but that's not the case um, rna is able to catalyze reactions it's when you think about what rna can do one it can move in 3d space but also it can hydrogen bond um, so you know it's it's capable um, now, the study of enzymatic processes is the oldest field of biochemistry dating back to the 1700s, which I guess then you could, people who are enzymologists might say they're true biochemists, um, and they probably have some, some feet to stand on with that claim. Um, the study of enzymes has dominated biochemistry in the past, and it continues to do so. Uh, the field of biochemistry, however, has kind of expanded in the sense that now it also appeals to uh or it also has stronger links in fields like molecular biology and cell biology um, but at its heart it's kind of all about the enzymes okay now why biocatalysis over inorganic catalysis well the the simplest way or the simplest thing to think about there is an enzyme is going to be much more selective and specific um, so it's going to find a substrate and only produce a specific product um, compared to an inorganic uh, catalyst where you're going to have a racemic mixture of two different forms of molecule. For instance, if you're, if you're producing a sugar, you might produce both the L and D variation of that with a, with a enzyme or a biological catalyst. You don't have to worry about that. Um, another thing that is a benefit to using an enzyme is much more mild reaction conditions. Um, as an example of that, one thing that you'll learn about in um, in your metabolism class if you opt to go on to take that class is you'll learn about nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen fixation in an industrial process is mm -hmm. done by something called the Haber-Bosch process, which involves heating to something like 900 degrees at extremely high pressure so you're getting uh sorry for the production of this would be n to nh3 um, in order to do that you have to have these extreme conditions to break that triple bond where so that's the industrial process contrary to that um, there are microorganisms that can catalyze this reaction basically at, at, at room temperature, so they don't have to have those extreme conditions. Um, and so, you know, most reactions are going to be done at a pH of around 7 and about body temperature, basically. Um, so, that's that's another example why a biological catalyst is kind of has an advantage um now higher reaction rates they are going to be reactions are going to be catalyzed in a very narrow time frame so it's not going to take you know minutes hours days um, the reaction is going to get done fairly quickly and as a result it's going to be able to be done over and over and over again and this last item that's mentioned uh, is capacity for regulation. And that's a good thing to think about um, if you're going on to take metabolism, because that's all that that class, no, that's selling it short. 
that's one of the high points of that class is the discussion of regulation of different um, metabolic pathways so if this pathway is ongoing and the enzymes involved in this pathway are are producing their products well then that might be so a synthetic process the enzymes involved in a synthetic process might be inhibiting a degradative process so you have basically a means to stop one reaction from taking place in favor of another reaction taking place um, so then down here at the bottom of this slide is simply uh, metabolites so this uh, this metabolite right here is corismate which it can go in a number of different directions and let's label these a b c and d so we can generate all these different products i'm sure there are others as well um, however one enzyme is going to take corismate mutase is going to take our corismate and send it this direction oh i'm sorry that's embarrassing yawning um whereas another enzyme will send it in B direction, a different enzyme in A, and a different enzyme in C. And if you think about this in a biological pathway sense, well, chances are that um, this, this product right here is probably going to either, what it could do is it could inhibit reaction B and A, but activate uh, or sorry B and C would be inhibited that's how I drew those lines with the like basically large letter T's um, or it could um, activate enzyme A mm -hmm. so enzyme substrate selectivity enzymes are going to have very specific um, capabilities so this is the example here is the amino acid phenylalanine or i'm sorry the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase which will take the enzyme or sorry the amino acid phenylalanine phenyl yl that should be a yl phenylalanine there we go phenylalanine and make um, that would be tyrosine um, these two are your two um, these two structures are your um, are examples of stereoisomers and what we're seeing here is that only one of those stereoisomers is going to be only one stereoisomer of phenylalanine, which I believe that would be the L phenylalanine, is going to be converted to L tyrosine. Whereas that D phenylalanine, well, it's not even going to bind to our enzyme. Our enzymes are that specific. Um, and then alternative of that is a, a derivative molecule that, or well something that looks it's got a six-membered ring but not a whole lot that looks the exact same as phenylalanine um, it might bind but it's not going to have any reaction which if you think about um, an enzyme catalyzing a reaction this would be a good example of an inhibitor and enzyme inhibition is something that we're going to spend a good bit of time discussing um, and looking at different inhibitors and how they function and what their their implications are so just to kind of visualize this enzyme substrate complex well there are going to be certain amino acids within an enzyme that are going to give that selectivity so they're going to bind to a substrate and based on based on the amino acids in the active site of our protein so here's our enzyme this blue blob 
um, these this red space is kind of a heat map for our um, for the specific amino acids or for the amino acids within our active site and based on some changes of those well either we're going to be able to bind the substrate or we're not going to be able to bind that substrate all right well that wraps up the first part of uh, chapter number six we'll continue on with the next video thanks